It's the Christmas episode of Raw! And what a great holiday season it is! I mean, this episode of Raw was, well, it was kind of interesting and some people can't see their family this Christmas because of what's going on in the world. Randy Orton set a man on fire. At least we got red drops and downs. No, we had to move that out of this week because, you know, people are on holiday, which is important. <laughs> Isn't it just a great time <laughs> to be alive? Let's up those downs for Raw. Charlotte Flair started Raw off this week, so all that talk that maybe the Monday night show was going to be shaken up a little bit, well, I suppose we're either not doing that or we're holding it off till the new year, because once again, we just had an opening promo. And one of the first things that Charlotte said was, oh, I'm in the Thunderdome, and what would the Thunderdome be without a queen? <laughs> Charlotte, Thunderdome has been around for months. <laughs> You've been at home doing whatever you're doing. Literally nothing has changed. This thing got even more confusing because if somebody busted into my house right now, took a gun and put it to my head and demanded for me to tell them whether Charlotte Flair was a heel or a face, I would be dead right now. My blood would be over the floor because I don't have an answer to it. Because she said that she has returned to Raw as a champion because she's always a champion. Then she started acting all nice, nice to Oscar, but it was quite clear she only wanted the women's championship because by the time Oscar had come out there, she was like, hey ho, let's talk about that belt. And that was absolute nonsense too because straight away you have just negated the tag team titles i know these things don't matter it's just professional wrestling but at least give me 24 hours before you go ha, ha, i don't care about this it's why you need to separate the women's and the tag team championships they have to both feel important it also kind of makes oscar look like a dumbass because how could she not be able to figure this out if i can work it out from my couch when she is stood in the ring looking at this woman she should be like i don't think i should trust you you seem like an asshole oscar doesn't seem to care about though because she was just over the moon that she was a double champion which is true and just as these two were about to have a conversation we had our first interruption of the evening and my word there's more than one but it was Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler and they just said some of the most ridiculous things we have heard on a WWE show and that's saying something for ages Nia looked at Charlotte and went oh I see you're back with your robot voice you're it's not Kane from like the late 90s my name is Kane she just talks like an ordinary person the Former tag champs then started talking about how they took out Lana and Kyrie saying, I was a bit like, man, this was not the way you wanted to start Raw. And then we had our second interruption of the evening because here was Dana Brooke and Mandy Rose and they had even worse insults. Because they were all like, Nia, you look like Rudolph after a nose job. And I was like, where's that guy with the gun? Can he burst in here now and shoot me in the brain? Nobody makes fiend insults. You don't go, ha ha, it's December. Now I'm going to start taking jokes about Santa Claus. For some reason, Brooke and Mandy Rose also wanted a match with Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler, even though they aren't the champions anymore. They're like, you owe us a contest. It's like, why don't you just go and lay down? That would be more productive. And I don't want to be that guy. But this was absolutely the wrong thing to do after TLC 2020, which was such a fun and such an intriguing show. You just killed all the momentum and it's getting it down. We then did, however, get a hint about what WWE is going to do to fix ratings. And it's exactly the same thing they always do in a couple of weeks, we are going to have a Legends Night featuring Hulk Hogan, Ric Flair, Tory Wilson, and a bunch of other people. Now, the only thing I am excited about is that when all these people were flipping up on the screen, one of them was Carlito. I will be over the moon. I will do a backflip if I get to see Carlito. For what I remember, he spits in the face of people who don't want to be cool. It was in that tag match, and the only good part about it is when Oscar was asked, hey, who do you want to win this? And she said, well, I hope it's my sexy muscle friends. We have to protect Oscar at all costs. And also, if nobody's going out there and patting the name sexy muscle friends, I'm going to do it. I feel like I could use that in many situations, but yes, it's getting it down. It was just two teams that have nothing going for them. They're just there, and it went way too long. Like, how could you invest in this? There was no reason for it to be happening to begin with. It just ended too. Shayna caught Brooke in the Kira Feuda clutch, and she tapped out quicker than Lars Sullivan disappeared from TV. What I did appreciate is that she was kind of tapping before the move had even been applied, and that always makes it more devastating. But I honestly watched it like this. 
I had no emotion on my face and I started to think about pizza. As Naira and Baszler then yelled at Oscar and Charlotte, Mandy Rose and Dana Brooke attacked them from behind and threw them out the ring. And of course, we only did that to try and pretend that they don't suck, but in terms of win losses and their record, they do absolutely suck. Also, we just beat another tag team, which we're going to do later too. And the one thing that WWE needs right now is good, solid, actually believable women's tag teams. I mean, what on earth are we doing? The Hurt Business were then in the back and they helped a guy get changed. And I thought that was really nice. He was wearing a New Day top, but they thought he should be wearing a Hurt Business t-shirt. So they aggressively got him changed but it's nice to see a bunch of people doing a good deed. This was all leading to the VIP lounge too and these four just absolutely rock. It started as a united front when MVP was telling us how great they all were. And even though Shelton Benjamin tried to carry that on, Cedric Alexander stole the mic away and started doing, hey, I'm the best kind of shtick. And you could see in the background, Bobby and Shelton just looking at each other like they were brothers. This was their stupid younger sibling. But I just like this dynamic. Lashley also said that they are unbeatable, which may very well be true when it comes to Bobby. He is the most protected man in all of WWE. And as they went to have their photo taken, all of a sudden in the background on the top rope, was R-Truth, the 24-7 champion, and he photobombed the whole thing. Now look, R-Truth is absolutely brilliant. There should be a special wing for him in the Hall of Fame, but we really have to kill the 24-7 title stuff because it's just the same thing over and over and over again. Out came the geeks and they chased him away and you never even saw them again. Why don't we use all the momentum we've got with Truth and actually put him in a serious role for a while? You could even stick him in the Hurt Business. And then for the third time in the evening, this was then crashed or interrupted by Jeff Hardy and Riddle, and they just said a bunch of words too. At one point, Jeff was like, uh, Hurt Business, we prefer pride than greed, so stick that in your cranny. We preferred pride than greed, Jeff, just go get all of it. And then that segment just ended, and then in the ring, we had Drew Gulak versus Angel Garza, and I thought I must have fallen asleep and started watching Raw in March 2021. In fact, it had to be this all over again. All right, guys, it's time to write this week's episode of Raw. Let's get the magic out of dreams. And this week, we are going to have Angel Garza taking on True Gulak. And who's going to win? Lana. That doesn't work. Just let Angel Garza win. Still, I'll just be honest with you. I was pleased to see Angel Garza back because he's absolutely vanished. And while I would also enjoy it if WWE did more with Drew Gulak, I will take it one step at a time. Before all of this, Angel Garza was doing his row stuff saying, oh, I do this all for her. And the rumors do seem to think it's going to be the returning Eve Marie. And then, yeah, after around about three seconds, he hit the wing clipper and he got the one, two, three. But it was fine as a distraction. We'll see where it goes. I'm giving it a very weak up. I do think that the commentators of Raw are living in a completely different reality to me because they kept talking like Angel Garza had been on Raw every single week. And I was like, no, nah, brah. We haven't seen him since like the spring. Charlie Caruso was then chatting to AJ Styles and AJ is so mad at the Miz to the point he's gonna go on Miz TV. Which was next and you know what that means is two talk shows on Raw so I get to roll my own. It is. Hello, welcome to another episode of Simon Says, a Christmas themed edition. My friend, my man, what have you got me for Christmas? A pile of crap. <laughs> I wanna cry. My confidence is just always Always left in shadows. Anyway, out came Miz and John Morrison and they were absolutely devastated and they were so sad because they had tried to catch in their money in the bank at the pay-per-view and they had absolutely failed. Like all of Mojo Rawley's pushes. They also felt the need to apologize to AJ Styles and he just bombed out here and he didn't want any apology. He just wanted to get in the Miz's face and tell him, you, my friend, ruined the entire plan and you, my friend, are an idiot. Miz then went off saying he had won the money in the bank 10 years ago and cashed it in successfully and he just wanted a taste of that again, especially because the last 15 years he's just been coming out here trying to get respect from the WWE Universe and yet still he doesn't get it. I was like, man, Miz, I massively respect you. You've had an amazing career. You proved all the doubt was wrong. I think you need to listen to your heart. Anyway, to try and make it up to the phenomenal one, the Miz wanted him to be in the next Marine movie, and he even had a poster. And because I'm a moron, I did laugh just a little bit because the Miz was massive and AJ was about the size of the mouse. Also, John Morrison then started freaking out. Like, well, I'm not even on the poster. I meant to be your friend. 
it was kind of cute. And all this would have been fine too until Omos made the point that it was John Morrison that actually did the cash in and then a light bulb went off above Miz's head and he was like, oh my gosh, that's right. I was Mr. Money in the Bank, so I'm gonna try and get this rescinded. And I was like, no, don't, what are you doing? It's done, it's over. The Money in the Bank this year was not great, but don't just keep hitting it with a hammer, just let it lie and do better next year. Also, even if Miz does get it back, no one actually believes he's gonna become champion. For goodness sake, let it lie. But then had interruption number four because out came Drew McIntyre, Sheamus and Keith Lee and I audibly said out loud, even though I live alone in my house, why would these three care about these goons? They have whipped their ass for like the last 42 episodes of Raw. It was just too much down. Also, why would Seamus and Keith Lee be on the same page? It's been very, very clear they hate each other. They had written a sequel to The Nightmare Before TLC that Miz had recited last week. I didn't really think it was very funny, but they didn't have an ending, so they made up their ending there and then, which was just being up The Miz, being up John Morrison, and being up AJ Styles. If you're now asking yourself, why didn't the bodyguard Omos do anything? I have absolutely no idea. It all hit a wall when Styles kicked Keith Lee into Sheamus, just as Sheamus was about to beat everybody up. So then they started arguing, and this was a prelude to what was going to happen at the end of the evening. Then backstage, Drew was trying to calm everybody down, and the best bit is when he turned to Keith Lee and went, man, that Sheamus, he can be a bit of a hot-headed prick. He ain't wrong. And we are getting the six-man tag later. T-Bar then beat Ricochet. We can look at this in two different ways. On the one hand, this is a storyline that just keeps going round and round and round and round and nothing ever changes. Yes, it is. But on the other, has it actually seen Retribution get some wins and now they're not quite as big a losers as they were before? Well, this is also true, and because I'm pulling at straws, it's getting it up. It didn't go very long because we're not allowed wrestling on our wrestling show, and it ended making Ricochet look like an absolute goober because he forgot that he was in a wrestling match and he started yelling at Mustafa Ali and even hit him. And then he turned around and he got kneed right in the face and he got pinned one, two, three. Retribution them like, you should join us, you would join us. And I tell you the saving grace, go and watch Raw Talk and listen to Ricochet's promo. Why isn't he allowed to do that on the main flipping show? It was so good and made me go, oh my gosh, I believe it, I'm involved. Just can't figure it out. After all of this as well, the bad guys did say that they would end Ricochet's existence unless he joined Retribution. And usually I've been pulling down a kill him counter and going, I can't believe I saw a death threat in wrestling. <laughs> that means nothing now. I saw Randy Orton set another guy on fire. Escalation is a very real thing. Had an interview with the New Day Next that had been filmed earlier in the day and they think that they are going to win back the titles from the Hurt Business and get back to the top because that's just what the New Day does. Positivity. Also, it's probably true. There's no other teams. Although WWE may be about to fix that because they did put Riddle and Jeff Hardy together as the Hardy Bros as they were taken on MVP and Bobby Lashley. Sucks to be them because they lost, but up. Cedric Alexander was being a nuisance on the outside as you would expect, but it didn't really work because even though Riddle got the hot tag, as soon as Bobby Lashley was in there, he was just destroying everybody because do not forget the most protected man in all of WWE is Bob Lau. That doesn't work, Bobby Lashley. Just to double down on that too, we kind of got a repeat of last week. Well, let's face it, that ain't that big a surprise when it comes to Monday Night Raw, because Jeff Hardy went to give Bobby Lashley the twist of fate, but Lashley kind of squirmed out of it. He put on the hurt lock and nobody gets out of that. It's just too, I don't know, powerful. Jeff Hardy, he tapped out. The Hurt Business do continue to dominate though, and really when you look at the entire landscape, that is what we should be doing. They're one of Raw's very, very few highlights. <laughs> that was then back next. <laughs> I guess it went like this. All right, guys, we need another match for Raw, and I think it should be Grandmother Metalik, and he should be taking on Jackson Riker, and apparently we're also just going to have Elias sit on the top rope throughout all of it. Oh, it's going to be a good show. Yep, Jackson Riker versus Grandmother Metalik, or Grand Metalik. It didn't even go one minute. And it started with Elias in the ring going, oh, I'm going to sing a song with my new friend. And then they just had the match and you just beat him. Shit, powerbomb, set a powerbomb, one, two, three. And I was like, well, I guess Riker found some free time from the Starship Enterprise and now he's just doing this. I do not understand this pairing at all. I don't mean to repeat myself, but it's just so random. Down. A murderer then walked to the ring and nobody cared and nobody was bothered. Of course, though, this was Randy Orton. And let's just call a spade a spade. Randy Orton has a great 2020. He's got all the momentum in the world and I was excited to see him. 
up. And I was in tears straight away as the announcers told us that Randy Orton was completely justified setting fire to The Fiend because that was the rules of the match, but then he went too far because he set The Fiend too much on fire. And I was like, what a sentence that is. Only in wrestling in WWE are you gonna get that. You should have only set him on fire a little bit, but you set him on fire a lot, and therefore, we don't like you. Right away, Randy also told us that he was proud for what he did to The Fiend at the pay-per-view, and if he had the chance, he could do it again. I was like, all right, fair play. At least you're being honest, and you're also insane. Randy blamed all of this as well for the voices in his head, which is very handy because they are the lyrics in his entrance music, and said that they had fluttered away, and now they had been replaced just by the screaming of Bray Wyatt. And I was like, man, Randy, you are one flubbed up individual. But even then, as the lights started to flicker, he knew what could be coming, so he bailed out the ring. But he didn't get Bray Wyatt. Instead, we got another interruption, but it was Alexa Bliss on a swing. Her major point was that at some point, The Fiend may come back to WWE, and if he does, he is going to be more terrifying than ever. And look, I think we have to put faith in Bray Wyatt here. He's done a couple of returns, and every time he's absolutely smashed it, I don't know what he's got in the back of his head, but I actually think it may be quite good. See, he has my confidence, and now I will believe that he will fulfill on that confidence. So we're gonna find out one way or the other, but it has to be something to do with murder revenge. Someone tried to kill him, and now he has to try and kill him back. Also, just think of some of the things we have seen in WWE this year. Baron Corbin threw two dudes off a roof, so that's death. Seth Rollins tried to rip out somebody's eye, and now we just have pure fire. So I don't know what people are talking about. WWE needs to be more edgy. They have been pretty edgy throughout the entire year. Charlotte and Oscar then defeated Peyton Royce and Lacey Evans. So one, we actually did separate Peyton Royce from Billy Kay just to throw in another tag team, even though the Iconics were better. And two, here we did have another pairing that probably needed a win, so we actually have some challenges in the women's tag team division, and we just jobbed them down the toilet. That was a terrible use of phrase, either way down. And what did we even have here too? Peyton Royce and Lacey Evans were mad at each other before this even began because Peyton Royce wanted everyone to know, uh, I got us this match, I challenged Charlotte, so I don't know what Seven Bale is going on about, but then she wound up in the figure eight and she just tapped out. Now, this match wasn't bad at all and I enjoyed everybody in it, but who did Oscar and Charlotte Flair just beat? The random coming together of Peyton Royce and Lacey Evans. So this didn't help anybody and it was just there. It's actually giving me a little bit of a headache, although that could be this hat. It is so flipping tight. We saw Sheamus, Keith Lee, and Drew McIntyre getting ready for their big main event, and we had a little video with Titus O'Neil, and that guy is just the best person on the planet. He just goes out there, and he helps the community 24-7. We also saw The Miz on the phone saying, hey, I want my money in the bank match, and AJ Styles walked up to him, beep, and he hanged up the phone. I was like, man, AJ Styles, he is always on the right page. He knows how we're thinking. Our main event was next, and my face actually went like this because this episode of Raw was just all over the place, especially as this was like a six-man festive street fight, or whatever the hell they called it, and even though it was a street fight, they didn't use any weapons until the last two minutes, and they had to tag in and tag out. Imagine you were having a fight with your friends or your enemies on the street, and you had Dave, and Dave was like, man, tag me in, tag me in. Like, Dave, just get over here and use a pipe. It's a street fight. Either way though, it was fine, it was kind of fun. Up. The big twist here, of course, was that halfway through, Sheamus and Keith Lee fell out with each other because they just can't get it on, and because AJ Styles hasn't gone to enough tables in the last 24 hours. At one point, Drew McIntyre beat him up, picked him up, and indeed held him through a table. I think John Morrison also chucked Sheamus through another table. I mean, that spot has been so run into the ground, it's impossible to keep up. And of course, because it was the ending to a Raw in 2020, the WWE Champion was also beating up Johnny Boy and The Miz and just chucking them around the place. I mean, how many times has that happened recently? The answer is a lot. There was also a bunch of kendo sticks dressed up like candy canes, so everyone started to hit everybody else as if they were swords, but it was the ending where the story took one step forward. Because Drew McIntyre was about to win, Sheamus tagged himself in, and because Drew is the captain, he was like, all right, boy, you go and get him. But then Keith Lee, he tagged himself in, and the Irishman did not like that. We then had quite a good bit where Keith Lee went and attacked John Morrison first, because he was on the apron, and he landed in Omos's arms. He was like, oh, phew, thank goodness for that. And then do you know what AJ Styles' bodyguard did? He just took him, and he threw him through a table. Lee followed this up with a spirit bomb to get the one, two, three, so just as I was like, oh man, fabulous. Maybe the end of 2020 is gonna be really good for Mr. Lee. Sheamus, 
bro kicked him right in the face. Now, to be fair, I understood why he did do this, because he did blind tag himself in, but Drew McIntyre was beside himself and actually had one of the best lines I've heard in ages, because earlier they'd fallen out and he calmed them all down. He looked at Sheamus, he went, man, what are you doing? I told him you were cool. Like he'd been invited around to a party and some guy rang up the police and told everyone, there's beers here, you need to come and arrest them. This, honestly, this is one of the craziest episodes of Raw's I have seen in so long. It must have been written like five minutes beforehand. There was just no thread throughout the whole thing whatsoever. The show then ended really quickly as if one of these guys had also got naked and started running around and Vince was like, well, nobody wants to see that. Look at me, I'm laughing because it was just, it was so strange. We were all so excited coming off TLC and they just write things down. That's what they do, write things down. They use the hat, I can't get it, it's over there. They use the hat of dreams. I don't want to be that guy, I really don't. I hope everyone is doing well, but we've got no choice overall. It is getting a down. Now don't forget to leave a comment below and let us know what you thought about last night's episode of Raw. And again, if you enjoyed it, you win. It's an entertainment show. If you were entertained, how can anybody be mad about that? Like the video, share the video, hit the subscribe button. It's absolutely free. Go over to whatculture.com. You can read other opinions about Raw, not written by me. You can follow WhatCulture on Twitter, WhatCultureWWE. And you can watch more videos here on What Culture Wrestling. My name is Simon from What Culture. We will be back throughout the week with AEW ups and downs and we'll do SmackDown ups and days on Boxing Day. But just in case I don't see you beforehand, make sure you have a great holiday season. Put a smile on your face. It's all fun and games at the end of the day. I'll see you soon. Then head over to whatculture.com. We have a website. Take a little look. We have a Twitter at WhatCultureWWE and you can watch more videos on this YouTube channel. You're already here. My name is Simon from What Culture. Thank you for joining me as always. And it's one of those weeks when we got loads of ups and downs to do because we had NXT and then there's just so much information to get into. And I will see you for every single one.